So uh, welcome everyone for uh, learning design special interest group webinar, uh, which happens every th third Friday at 12 p.m. Um, every month. Uh, so we start around in February and go up to November, depends on you know uh, other activities, because sometimes we have, and we will shortly talk about it, that we have uh, something called hackathons as well, that uh, sometimes is um, a hybrid event that we do um, on, on, a, on a particular location. Last year it was <clears throat> at Melbourne. So if any such things are happening, then we, we might not have the webinar. But so <clears throat> welcome everyone. We are in learning design special interest group is um, uh, uh, led by uh, Associate Professor Leanne Nagel, uh, Keith Haggard, uh, Dr. Keith Haggard, Kate Michel, uh, Kate is here with me. And, and uh, I have apologies from Keith, he's running late or probably can't make it. And so does uh, Leanne as well. Um, Learning Design Special Interest Group runs webinar, as I mentioned, and also hackathons as well. So last year we ran about three hackathons and one face-to-face. -face. Is that right, Kate? I think so. About yes. that, maybe a few more than yeah. I think it was about that. Yeah, um, and we have a, a hackathon website as well, where all the uh, scenario that we work with it is all there and in, in there as well. Um, this year, the Askelet. 2024 conference will be held in Melbourne, Melbourne University, Kate, your, your home uh, institution. And theme is uh, navigating the terrain, uh, emerging frontiers in learning spaces, pedagogy and technology, which will happen between 1st to 4th December this year. So stay tuned and like, uh, I think call for uh, expression of interest in submitting papers or other uh, form of presentations is open now until 7th of July. So, so I'll start with uh, um, acknowledgement of the country. So on behalf of uh, Learning Design Special Interest Group, Askelite, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders present here and will be watching the recording. Um, so uh, from last year onwards, uh, we have moved our um, communication, all communication for learning design special interest group from teams to uh, more open, space in LinkedIn. So uh, what you the QR code that you are seeing is uh, our LinkedIn group, uh, which is called Australian Association of Learning Designers. So please um, uh, be part of that. Uh, uh, then you will be updated on all learning design um, special interest group activities. So today's presentation is um, led by uh, Dr. Seb Tianti, uh, who is a senior academic lead, uh, digital learning futures in um, uh, education strategy at Charles Darwin University. Um, the <clears throat> presentation will be um, for transformative exploration of cutting edge student partnership model in Australian education. Now, I mean, you can say like, you know, oh, wow. I think all the way until the end, uh, end of this, uh, what about this? And this is like really uh, uh, current. Everybody is talking about it. Um, so Seb is going to talk about, um, uh, he is going to look at like in depth, look at the digital um, critical student partnership in learning design model, drawing upon um, his own framework that fosters meaningful collaboration between students and educators through digital platforms. So, uh, Seb, uh, we are already seven minutes into it, so I'll not be going through everything that um, in the blog, but um, I just want to say a few things about uh, the presenter. Uh, Seb is, is, uh, is interested and in specializing in digital technology in, in educational strategies with rich background as senior teaching fellow in digital curriculum design. He is former director of culturally and linguistically diverse lab at University of Queensland and also um, 
he worked in numerous other institutions. And at this time, he is in Charles Darwin University. So Seb, I, I would like you to start with saying a little bit uh, about yourself and your mm -hmm. interest, research interest, and um, uh, we will go from there. So over to you. I will just stop sharing my screen so that you can share, Seb. Yes, wonderful. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Kashmira. Uh, I will also, yeah, definitely, I'll share my um, research interests as well before I get started as well. But just before we get started, I just want to make sure that you can see that okay on full screen mode? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. And what I'll do as well, at the same time, I will try to um, get the chat open as best as I can so I can answer your questions as we go I, along. We can, I'll keep an eye on it as well, Seb, so okay, we can wonderful. always uh, collate them at the end. Okay, that might be better. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you again, Kashmira. Yeah, so before I get started, uh, yeah, my research interest, as Kashmira has asked, is around benchmarking, um, indigenization of the curriculum, student partnership, and technology-enhanced learning. Um, there's also um, a part of me that also I'm quite interested into critical digital pedagogy, critical pedagogy, uh, critical theory, um, and a critique of current neoliberal practices within higher education. So it's a, it's a broad spectrum, but there's an interwoven aspect of social justice. Um, and within that, through how we can embrace that through learning design, um, through student partnership, and through the other aspects of these third spaces that we all live and breathe. So that's uh, a little bit of um, introduction, a bit of a research interest. So if um, any of that research or research interest um, interest any of you out there, please email me at seb.dianati at cdu.edu.au. Uh, all right, without further ado, I'll get started the presentation and hopefully the, the slides will move as, and you can see the changes in the slides coming up. Oh, good, thank you. Um, I would also like to acknowledge from our mob and our country up here is Larrakia Nation. Um, and, and we say New Jarak, uh, a word that we say you have arrived um, more than how we do in Western democratic societies of, of a conversation of how are you. Um, it is how we, we ensure that you, we know that you're here and we, your presence is enough. Um, so we say New Jarak as in you arrived. But I'd, lost, I'd like to extend my uh, welcome to um, any First Nations elders, um, but also people, not only on in your land, with your mob, but with us here in Larrakia Nation and on Gulamaran um, language. So thank you for that, um, for that extension of that welcome. This is the title, sounds convoluted, sure. Um, and maybe it is, perhaps on purpose. But what it is, it's kind of that critical theory, critical pedagogy mixed with learning design, mixed with student partnership. Now you put those three together and that's really the epicenter of today's workshop. Um, this was just released a couple of days ago, which I'd like to let you guys know that my uh, new book is out on the commercialization of massive open online courses. And my argument um, through this kind of a longitudinal study, which started with my PhD back in 2014, and I traced the, the movement from OER to MOOCs and to what we saw from an open source for open and good value of education to becoming more closed and for profit from the largest MOOC providers. So, and I think the offset, and once I, I kind of um, end the book is that we should focus on quality education, not for the money's sake, and not to credentialize and micro credentialize, which I argue is kind of the offset or a byproduct of the MOOC movement. But I think it's it's an interesting read, and for those that have that critical eye, and we're gonna see, but it provides a, a methodological frame and a process to critique and a way to critique um, ideologies within things that sound benevolently progressive, like free open mind education. So I'm um, not here trying to do a spiel for Springer or Power Grade Pivot or anything, but um, I just thought I'll, I'll share that about more about my research interest. But yeah, to get back to, on today's aim, and hopefully I'll try to get as much through as much as I can. 
But um, from today, I guess we've got three aims. Is to I wanted to share with you the framework of digital critical partnership, and that's where providing a step by step methodology about how learning designers can work with student partners. So that is an area or a gap within the literature and also in practice that hasn't really been fully explored. Hopefully, there's something in it for you in from this workshop. And the one thing that hopefully that you get out of it is that you know where your university lies in the broader spectrum of Australian higher education. So I hope to provide an audit and a benchmark of all scholarship and teaching activities, as well as indigenization as a key focus and student partnership. But I'll start with a broader sector, a benchmark to see and understand the, the sector as it's moving in its shape today. And lastly, I wanna finish off with a practice. And uh, as we are all critical pedagogues and we do CPAR or critical participatory action research, is that we live out our theories through practice. And hopefully I could share my story about bringing in the UQ kind of model of student partnership into an innovative indigenous student partnership model. And this is where we had paid partnerships for 18 different indigenous students working with academic staff on various disciplines on various projects. So um, to embed and to indigenize the curriculum. So hopefully you, you get a taster of not only a framework, a benchmark and a practice, but I'll hopefully I'll, I'll try to rush through the slides as quick as possible. And I've tried to make them not as word dense because we all learn and we can, uh, it's easier, it's more engaging when we have less words and more pictures. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll get started. Okay, so what is critical digital partnership? It, it really stemmed from um, Stonewall and Morris as well well over a decade ago now. And they suggested it's kind of where social justice and education meet with um, learning design. And from that is where I've kind of moved critical digital pedagogy to critical digital partnerships as my model in the CDP model. But really what CDP in the uh, the pedagogy uh, was around is, is Stonewall suggested it has to have four things. It had to be community centered and a collaboration in practice, exact something like this must remain open to diverse international perspectives that can communicate and collaborate on, that can cross those political boundaries. It must be beyond a single voice, but uh, um, um, multiple voices. And then it must have application outside the institution, like this Ascolite C right now. This is an application of that four criteria about it having um, application outside the institution. So what's the problem? The problem is that there, there hasn't been a, a, a framework for learning designers to work with student partnerships, but also there hasn't been beyond that principles for guiding both the Indigenous student partnership space, but also the students as partners with the learning designer space. So in my earlier research a couple of years back and then back in 2023 again, I hope to bridge that by providing a process based model, but also a holistic cycle model that we all know and breathe in action research. So what does this look like? Now, this is the picture that I got straight from my own research back in 2022 about that critical digi digital partnership model. And I suggested that if learning designers don't know where to start with students, then a good place to start, I go, we can um, dissect what we do. And I said, what are the different aspects of projects that I've been working on? So. I looked at, back at all the aspects of learning design as well as in all the aspects of student partnership. And I was thinking, how could we, I could develop a, a, you know, a nine step model where a student or a learning designer could work on any one of these one parts. The, the process here, which I should have made more clearer, doesn't need to be one, you have to finish the other, but rather a smorgasbord for ac academics or learning designers and students partners to come together and to find out what they'd like to work on together. So if anything, it was more a way and a starting point to have that conversation when learning designers or academics, or perhaps the student don't know where to start in a new student as partners model work in partnership with learning designers. Now, um, wonderful. 
And I, and I think this is what developed in my further research after the process-based learning design, uh, critical digital partnership model is, well, how do we enact this in practice? And I, with another colleague of mine, Amy Hickman, who's now at Flinders University in the School of Medicine, we then developed what we called an unconference, um, a diversity, equity, inclusion unconference that was led by students with students guided by um, my kind of critical digital partnership principles um, uh, process. So we used that process, we applied it to a new practice, then we, we de then developed our own uh, principles based on that practice to go, okay, it's not just the process of CDP, said that's great that you made a new framework and everything, but how do you apply that in practice and what principles will you uphold with learning designers and students when they're working together as well as within new initiatives where students are taking charge and uh, are taking action in a positive way. And we we kind of, we, we developed in, from um, Kelly Matthews' work, which is, she's one of the earlier scholars in the students as partners literature at the University of Queensland and really put my first step up there at, at UQ. But it has to be inclusive. It has to nurture power. Um, it has to engage with the process with uncertain outcomes. It must engage ethical partnerships and enact uh, transformation. This might sound all good and well, but you know, in of the of the forty projects, student partnership projects I've been in, about third of them didn't meet those criteria or hadn't um, haven't you know academics or the students thought that they didn't get what they wanted out of it. Um, and uh, for many, it was that. Uh, they were looking at it as a product rather than appreciating that this is a transformative process. And they weren't, and it was hard for, for some in other projects, for academics or learning designers to give up power to go to with students, to foster a new type of relationship with students, not the I know everything, you know nothing model, that uh, the empty vessel model that Paulo Freire talks much about in his Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But the principles are so important because it guides our practice and the practices guides our, our principles. So this is the, the development, further development of that process-based digital model from with, with myself and Hickman. And we suggest that partnerships need to be both reciprocal, they need to be respectful and have to have responsibility. And that fuels into the CDP principles of critical digital pedagogy and partnership that it has to be open to diverse voices. You don't just pick the highest uh, achieving student. It should be collaborative and community driven and it should have applications much like this Ask Light SIG outside the classroom where we as academics, learning designers, students can come together and share new types of practices and a new form of education. And, and that, that new form of education is how we, we want to idealize a better world or a better education. The best way to do that is start with our own ideals. And then we do that with compassion, connection, and courage. And the reason why those values are in there is because it takes a lot of courage for academics as well as learning designers to give up that power. And it takes a lot of courage as well for students to get to receive that power. Um, it takes compassion because for both learning designers and for academics, we need to find a new compassionate way to, to feel and to think and to be heard, um, to understand the, the viewpoints of our students. So this model kind of then kind of came to the end, which was that we there has to be courage outside, vulnerability within. It has to be multidisciplinary and multidimensional. It's multicultural, multi-capable and multivocal, digitally enhanced and values-based. So it was that the pedagogy came before the technology. I know we always say that with learning designers, but this is a model in which that takes student partnership and learning design with a process-based model and hopes to bring it all together. That's ethically and principle-based. Now, the student partners literature, I'm just going to touch in. It doesn't take much. You could do a Scopus review. You can see that this is skyrocketing. And it makes sense because now well over half the Australian universities do have student partnerships in them and I'm and I hope if you could share in the chat box if your university has a students as partners model paid or unpaid um and so and see if it's same with the the scholarship that I did and my a lot of my benchmarking is that I'm a bit of an online stalker you know I, I just watched this thing last night um 
called baby reindeer and, and perhaps i'm a bit of a an online stalker or you could call me martha i'm, I'm not too sure but what i do I, I systematically go into every website detail of every university in australia and look in their scholarship look in their learning design page and look at what models do they have what student partnerships do they have what um, support do they have for academics? So I've got about well over a thousand data points from all the different types of universities that came together for this benchmark, not only for a broad spectrum of benchmark, but I also did specific benchmarks for students' partnerships and a specific one for indigenization and a specific one for learning design. So hopefully um, I'm, I can bring some of that together today. This is just one of the benchmarks on, on Students as Partner, which is a new paper that I'm currently putting out with a colleague, Teresa, from University of Sunshine Coast, where we suggest that different universities have different types of partnerships um, with students in different ways. Some with learning designers, some with academics only, but some do it cosmetically and just pretend, you know, and say, oh, yeah, we're doing a great job. So then once we got into the nitty gritties of these universities, I, we then put them in quadrants about how transformative these partnerships really are to the more cosmetic partnerships, doing it for employability. And I think that's all right and well, but I think you can see that the benefit and the real difference students as partners from the cosmetic partnership from the transformative ones. Um, this was the other benchmark I did with um, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor um, Academic, I know, Deputy Vice-Chancellor First Nations Leadership here at Charles Darwin, uh, Reuben Bolt. So our research together currently um, in the finishing stages, we're doing the same, but doing a benchmark of all different universities and their different approaches to indigenizing their curricula. Some say, yeah, we're doing it. Yeah, we put it in our graduate attributes. Yeah, we've got a website with resources. But I, again, went deep um, with a fine tuned nail to every website and every resource that I could find online. And then I put them and I scaled them and I rated them against what I believed or what we believed was um, a real emancipatory indigenization to more cosmetic. Uh, so that's kind of the research. So now what I'm gonna do is give you a quick snapshot of, of the different findings that I found across the university. And we um, that doesn't have, uh, it's not immediately applicable to the title of my presentation, but it hones in. Uh, I love honing in to, uh, to things. So what we found is that the majority of universities have a Peer, peer evaluation of teaching model. You go, oh, well, Seth, that's great. Um, why is that big news or good news? Or you go, well, I can, you could use this research to or go, actually, we should develop one. And this is something that was an eye opener for me that we don't have one in Charles Darwin University. And that's hopefully something that I can, I'm going to be bringing in, but based on this review. Um, early assessment, we find that majority of unis do have an early assessment uh, procedure or policy in place. However, the adoption and implementation has been a bit of a struggle. Teaching and learning week, this is an interesting one. This is the, you know how every unit has their own symposium uh, and they bring in learning designers and student experiences. Well, we found that post COVID, there's actually been a decline in universities re-uptaking learning and teaching weeks or symposiums. Um, but that's an, I've got a whole different spreadsheet just on looking at different symposiums. But a big argument that I've made in the new paper on just on teaching and learning week, if anyone wants to jump on that research with me, is not only the, the declining trend, uh, but they're becoming shorter and more specific in, fo in focus. But um, please reach out if any of you have any in interest of this area or would like to do a shared learning and teaching week in learning design um, or student partnership or transformative um, assessment. Most web, uh, not most, it seems like some, well, it's, it's been half a half a mil that have a website dedicated like RMIT or you'd have a website dedicated with resources and best practices of academics and learning design models. Um, and they'll suggest how they're doing things. So um, that's quite split within the sector. Um, the majority of unis don't have a buyout program. So let's just say if you want to work with a learning designer and do a new grant or a new initiative so that academic can be bought out, it seems like the group of eight tend to have a buyout program. They, they call these mini grants or multidisciplinary grants or other initiatives or upskilling or uplift initiatives, they call it UQ. But it seems that this is um, few and far between. But this is something I, I believe that we should be having more in the sector. Self-paced online modules. Um, this is an interesting one as well, which is kind of split again, half that way down the middle, is that most unis across Australia, half... 
half do and half don't ish have a self paced online module. So this is like uh, I think of a graduate certificate of university teaching and learning that's modulized and more for in between an academic induction and a full grad cert. Um, some unis do these modulized learning design based um, modules where academics, new academics take or others that want to do it take um, for either badge or, or a short course or a, a micro cert. So um, that was interesting. Um, I was expecting more here, but most uh, but most universities do have uh, the majority, not not by a sizable majority, but enough have academic workshops. Resources, yes. Um, this is something that my own university unfortunately doesn't do as well because we don't have a publicly facing website. So it's funny that I I was actually saying no to a, a lot of these things for my own university, even though we do on a private share SharePoint space behind a uh, wall but we don't actually share that practice with other universities which i uh, is something that i'm hoping to change as well on my on my end academic mentoring programs this is when we would work with a learning designer or with a subtle or with a junior with a senior ac academic um again you can see that the numbers do vary but there is uh um the majority don't Academic development programs across Australia, and we're seeing this change with the rise and um, I guess the dominance of um, high, higher education, HEA fellowships, I'll, I'll get that too. But university, some universities have developed their own HEA. They go, all right, we'll take HEA and we'll make our own HEA with learning design. And we're going to put that together and make our own model. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. MOOCs, let's not go into MOOCs right now. Uh, but yes, it seems that majority of unis across Australia have a MOOC in some capacity, and even more have a short course or a micro cred based on the government funding of the, the previous budget that were really fueling that micro creds. And I'm sure that all our learning designers here have been busy developing a micro cred or something based on previous budgetary policy. Um, this is something surprising, and I wish we had more of, which is OER grants offered. Um, open education resources or, or um, to have have uh, freely available online resources. Um, and subtle framework, I'll let you guys see this. Uh, and that's just when we, again, you have a scholarship of teaching and learning framework that some universities have, some don't. And this is that, you know, you know things like, you know, we'll make sure that all our assessment is authentic, early, continuous, varied. We ensure that we provide learning outlet, whatever. But, and then they'll give it a nice acronym and call it what it is. Um, this is funny, yeah, interesting that um, the majority of universities don't have an academic portfolio or profiles. Um, what I mean by that is that they don't support academics to kind of develop a, a subtle um, a subtle presence or what subtle is or how subtle can be enacted um, more publicly rather than privately. Um, newsletters, yeah, that's fine. Teaching awards, majority do. HGA fellowships, this is growing. Um, like I said, others have taken the Hertzer route with the fellowship. Others, HGA or others have developed their own. Innov teaching innovation grants, looks like that's split. Um, we don't have any here at CDU, being a small uh, regional university. Um, or seed grants, but that might be different in your own university. Community of practice, I sh I've started this. I'm, sh I'm sure every learning designer has been in one, I've started one, I've developed one. And I think this Ascolite SIG is a perfect example of a good uh, SIG. I, I think it's a better word than the COP that we used to work, use back in the day with Wegner. Um, but it, it, we can see that um, these are, uh, they, but they need to be nurtured. And I'm sure that we can all um, know that we've been into a COP or a SIG that hasn't been nurtured and it kind of does well to begin with and kind of fizzles out, but it does need that structured um, approach. But it seems that like the majority of universities do have a COP, a SIG, a COP, you know what I mean. Um, and many are moving towards developing a capability framework where they could use it for teaching focused um, promotions. And I think I, I was speaking to just Kashmir earlier today about how many universities actually have a framework that go, actually, this is what you need to be doing in types of evidence at different types of criteria at different levels, depending if you're teaching focused or if you're research focused. 
Um, but you can see that while the majority, only by a slight, have a framework, the other half don't, or they do, but they, it's actually a different type of framework and they're, they're developing it or they're developing it for a promotion or they're developing it for their grants. Um, yeah, interesting enough that that uh, I thought there would be a lot more promotion support when academics are going for promotion, but it's not. Student partnerships. So this is probably where I was getting in more importantly. Uh, uh, Kate, please go ahead. You had your ha hand raised. Oh, I, no, I didn't want to cut you off, Seb. I was just, no, um... please do. Because <laughs> um, I think uh, there's a few questions in the chat and there's um, some that uh, Kashira and I have also been adding in the chat. <laughs> um, and, and I loved your point about some of the promotions pieces. So it'd be great to hear more um, about that too in, in terms of what, what that means for some of this work, you know, when we don't have funding or buyout or promotion opportunities or those things are maybe immature. Um, but uh, I, I noticed um, it'd just be great to know, I guess, um, if you're talking about some of these partnership models, like what, what ones exist. Um, and maybe you're, you're about to get into that here because I noticed your slides about students as partners. So maybe that is a good segue just in terms of, you know, are there, is there a variety of different partnership models out there? What, you know, what approaches do different institutions take? Yes, great. Yeah, so you know, um, good. So here you can say these are offers paid or unpaid. So that I was trying to get a bigger thing because uh, a bigger net because other uh, students and partners, unfortunately, some universities do unpaid student partnership, which I think is exploitation personally. And I think we should be, if you really honor and value what students are actually doing and saying and contributing, then we pay students, even if it's at a scholarship uh, stipend, but we still need to pay. And I think if there's anything else that you can take back to your universities for those that don't pay, um, please do or try to, um, or use either HEP or SAF money or, 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 or pocket, even when you're told not to. Um, but there's other ways and there's always other pockets of money if you can find it. Um, but yes, that's, that's a big um, thing uh, around the paid and the unpaid um, forms of labor. Um, the other forms of it is where it either goes under the, the voice of employability and it sets under students' experience and it's used as a placement or opportunity for some as a, a bolt-on uh, and it's more seen as, a, as something that students are getting work experience. The other lefty side where I'm from um, see this student partnership and so to break down the question, um, Ideologically and philosophically, we it, that spectrum is that work experience, employability to where I'm from, which is emancipation, liberation. This is um, a changing the way that students in the fourth space are meeting our colleagues in the learning design in the third space, who then can change the structures of power in the second space, the academics, who then uh, challenge the authority above in that first space. The DVCAs, um, but I, you know, it's funny because I, working, uh, and, it, and it's funny that I'm now working through, and I'm, I'm, I'm an acting director at the moment for Michael Sankey. Um, so I, and I feel like I'm uh, an imposter of all my research now because I'm up in that first space or, or or challenging that first space. So it's it's very interesting at, at my acting work at the moment. But yeah, so the answer to the question: different types of payment, different ideologies of what it is um, in itself, and what the outcomes are for it. And for the um, some have a, uh, have a principle and ethically aligned, some are not. Um, so those probably are the three tiers. So, so was it a rope becoming a learning design? Um, was it a rope to be? Oh, sorry, I was just putting a. <laughs> no, yeah. it's just another one. Um, Peter, you <laughs> had one earlier. Peter Mello, did you want to? Um... Oh, so, sorry. My, is, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Peter. How oh, are sorry. you? Sorry. I, I, I didn't expect to speak. Um, I, you, know, you talk about portfolio, Seb, and, and I think that's a great idea. You know, I, and to me, you know, as a learner, if I was going into an um, institution to study, I would read up about my, my lecturer's you know, research interests, but also, as you say, how they're putting, putting their subject matter expert knowledge into practice pedagogically. Um, uh, and yet I just wonder if some, some of our academics are a little bit reluctant to do that publicly because it means you've really got to put yourself out there, don't you? Because you're then open to being challenged. So, um, you know, I like didn't teaching. I like lecturing, you know. <laughs> yes. 
No, well said, Peter. You're right. And first of all, it is a power aspect of, of giving up that power, but also for students. Some students also don't feel, you know, they might come from a how high power culture and feel very uncomfortable challenging authority or suggesting that their voices should be heard just as equally as yours, Peter. So that uh, it could come the other way around as well, which I've noticed as well, um, that that power sharing is both a two way street. And I, I, what I've realized is that once I make it noticeable and when I you, you teach that with learning designers and academics and the students, when you develop a, a forced paid induction for both the, the, star, the students and the learning designers and the staff, more so for the students here, but you, you make that um, as part of the induction process and you outline the ethics, the ethical principles, and um, you, you outline all the aspects of what goes wrong and all the other um, like challenges of other partnerships, which is power sharing, time, you know, workload, commitments, as well as managing that the product is not always the product that you need. You know, consider that the process is an outcome in of itself rather than the product of and I, I guess that's a product of our market capitalization that we we see each every and everything as a commodity these days. You know, I'll, I'll do this for you know for you, and you do this for me. Uh, but yes, I uh, it's a good great question, Peter. Um, I'm all, I'm only on slide forty of eighty seven. How are we going for time? Are we doing okay? Should I speed this up, Kate? Yeah, or maybe we can do uh, Seb's presentation part two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i'm more yeah absolutely if you i can do this part two another and then we can keep this going um yeah we can yeah, yeah absolutely. you can you can go on for another 10 minutes Seb. wonderful okay and then if we need to i can then based on the, the my colleagues here or whoever's in this room you might go actually said can you do the indigenization one for us or can you do the one about all this other all the different type of learning design models out there or can you do one that's what are you know what are everyone doing in, in um, the third space or whatever? But I'm happy to do another presentation. And like I said, I've got all this data, and I've got no one to share it with. So please, uh, um, please use my uh, uh, my data in in some capacity, or, or please work with me or to do to do more research together. This is interesting, and I think this applies for all of us um, in this room. It, funny enough, where Australia's higher education is split half of our universities out there have a learning design model it could be whatever it might be it might be addy or whatever it might be backwards design whatever or that they might develop their own whatever it is. but there is no consistency across australia with a learning design model um and that's good to know if you do have it and that's good to know if you don't have it um not much to know if you're in that in between um, TELUS is, going, is gaining some traction now. Yes, it is, Kate. It's funny. I'm actually doing a study on TELUS with three colleagues, one from uh, with in Brazil, one in Croatia, one in Sweden, who are uh, applying TELUS in a kind of the first international type of application of TELUS globally. Because TELUS seems to be, well, while it kind of came up in the 2020s, um, it, it's, it seems to be very Austro-Asian centric. And I guess that's from the Agent Journal and its audience. Um, but uh, we're trying to take that uh, tell us uh, globally and see how well it applies. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in another conversation, perhaps, Kate. Um, but uh, yeah, it wasn't what we expected. Uh, yeah. This is interesting as well. This, and this is a part of where I'm coming today's conversation. So looking at um, the students as partners model and then the indigenizing the curriculum and bringing them together and doing an indigenous students as partners model. But just on the indigenizing the curriculum itself, half the universities do have an indigenizing the curriculum strategy. Um, the other half do, but they don't, they, they have it in student support. Um, the other bit they do, but they have a graduate attribute um, and they've set it something in their strategy, but they've got no deliverables and they don't keep themselves account. Others go do really well in a few faculties in the MBA program or in psychology or in the law degree in UWA. And then they, um, unfortunately, it's not a university-wide model. So that's why the yes and the no buts. And now you understand, Kate, where I get the yes and no buts from the TELAS model. <laughs> uh, okay, and so this is a, maybe a, a conversation I can have another day, but I've got 80 slides just on the indigenizing the curriculum benchmark, where I go through other universities' websites and content and uh, and look at the different uh, um, approaches and practices of different universities. And then I scale them based on um, good approaches or bad 
not bad, but you know what I mean. This one's really good at University of Sydney, which have uh, an MBA that program that's um, linked with Indigenous intellectual property and Indigenous knowledges, and also provides a blueprint for other business schools to follow. My only shortcoming for that is that with the funding with University of Sydney, I, I, I would have hoped to see that a larger scale movement, not just one for the business school, but I, I, I still put that as one of the, the most advanced of the things, but having its own shortcomings. But anyways, I'm not gonna, UQ has got another indigenizing model, which was a lot more process-based and which um, for those that didn't know where to start with indigenization um, and learning design, you'd go, all right, well, let's start with map and do a benchmark. Let's order and see what needs we need ourselves. Let's then develop some principles. Let's take this um, to uh, teaching learning committee, then take it to academic board, then get it uh, essentially supported. So that's the central model about how you'd be um, for other universities that didn't know where to start with the indigenization and want to take um, a more thorough approach. Again, um, UQ's early, not early, late to the game on this, um, but they, how they've gone about it is quite good. I like the methodical ways. But look, I'm not going to go through all the, the different uni ones, uh, and uh, maybe I'll save that for a different conversation and perhaps a different presentation. But what I'd like to share in the last few minutes is how I brought everything that I've done with the, the benchmarking, the indigenizing bench, uh, indigenization benchmarking, my students as partners scholarship and research and practice at UQ, and brought that together to develop kind of a, a pioneering initiative here at Charles Darwin, as, as we have 30% uh, of our population here in Darwin are in, indigenous. And so, um, however, that doesn't translate um, into the higher education sector, interestingly enough. But for us, um, Indigenous issues and culture is in the forefront of our mind. It's not just, a, it's not just a, a, a thing good to have. So having considered all that, we, I developed a sense of um, an Indigenous principles. And these were, oh, that's good, I have some background music. Okay, I don't know what that was. That was it was very interesting. Um, anyway, so so this kind of has even further developed my uh, students as partners principles with learning designers to now develop indigenous students as partners principles um, are based on um, that it has to be strengths based. It has to respect the the views of indigenous people. We have to protect the indigenous intellectual property rights of our staff and our students and we have to ensure that we see indigenous knowledges as a product of a larger system that is different but no less than a western knowledge construct or epistemological frame um, and that understanding of a different epistemology before we get into different theories and different principles i think it's understanding that epistemological understanding of different ways of knowing and being and thinking you know and so this is what then developed the indigenous intellectual property principles about having consent and attribution, ensure that was respect for culture. Um, there's connection to land and, uh, and nature, and there's an intergenerational uh, responsibility of both collective ownership and control. Um, this is just part of it. And the, the outcomes of it was, and this is, um, I, and I'm first to say that um, the the project started in November last year, and I was given six weeks to do it. And I was like, I said, we've got six weeks to start this program. There's no student partnership support here, and there's nothing. Um, you've got six weeks to get um, these students uh, on board, inducted. You got to get um, 18 staff on board, inducted, and trained, and paid all out within six, uh, six weeks. Um, so that was a real, real test of my um, thing. And I, I think you all know how at uh, institutions, it's kind of some pots of money, you have to use it before you lose it. And this was a HEP um, based funding, which were, they were going to lose it. And I'm like, no, this is my chance. I'm going to go full out of this. So I just emailed pretty much every person that I knew in the university and every student experience person that I knew. And I went hard. At, and look, the project was great. And the eight of those 18 projects, I'd say one third of them, or even about, you know, one, yeah, or even a quarter, didn't do too well. And I think that was my, uh, based on the, I had to pay the students in the partnership before they did the work. 
and you can understand how crazy you know well even if you paid me before i did anything i probably won't do as good a job if you paid me at the end um so based on the contingency of the funding i the, this model that i'm not going to sit here and say it was fantastic and it did really well i think how i was confined with the hep funding actually was a bit of the failure of this but it's through failure that we all learn and we try something new and that didn't work. Hey, Hep, you can't do, I've shown that it works. Let's try it again different year. Or, so um, uh, please take this with a grain of salt because uh, I want to let you know that it uh, there were some roads that uh, that weren't as 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 pleasurable or great. Um, and, you know, academics are like, oh, well, my students are not doing much at the moment. And I'm like, so the other thing that I'm developing at the moment is developing a bad system through Credly and hopefully I can use this as the allure. This sounds really bad. But I'm going to say that, look, you get a badge, a digital badge um, that says that you're an Indigenous um, student staff partner. Let's do this um, together. So that's now working to get another increase in uptake. Um, but um, I just thought I'd be candid. And yeah, thank you, Kate, as well. I thought I'd be honest and authentic with you all about this program and, I, um, and why I think in the next iteration it will do better. And how I, why I think it will be or do better is because then I could link it in better with uh, VC awards or with our promotions to have Indigenous knowledges um, to, to see if I can get the DVCA to in, embed this within some type of grant or further funding. All this could be is that how we can or lead it in and work with faculty to make sure that when student staff work with learning designers or um, with students that it contributes to their workload. This is not just an add-on but this is a part of our core business. Um, Great, great. Sorry, ensure the minute. Yeah. So, and I thought what I think what I've learned from all the different partnerships, um, from and the ones especially with learning design, is that having at least a fortnightly check in with a learning designer and the staff and the student together was critical because then other pockets, the students could go work together, all the students and the learning designer could meet together, but there needed to be a, a space where all different parties could come together and, and have a check in. A midpoint check in was critical as well, both by the organizer or me to do so as well as at the end, but also um, the induction at the front. Um, so this is an interesting byproduct that I wanted to share with you that I tried out and I failed again. But what I developed is, an, um, was trying to develop and, uh, and, and maybe I, if you, this sparks an idea with any of you, please email me. It was developing an Indigenous students' um, partners staff project engine as part of ChatGPT's four new um, chatbot where you can pre-program and you program, you put in information to develop your own specific output. So this, this little program or this chatbot that I made that was specific to this search engine was the Indigenous Students Academic Staff Project Engine. So what staff or students could do, because it was pre-populated with um, their projects, not with their data, but with their projects and with Indigenous language, um, I, I it kind of started to realise what we're doing and why we're doing it and put all the strategic plans. Uh, and don't worry, I've got the chat GPT for, you know, the Teams licence that makes sure that it's locally sourced, that it's uh, paid. But then I had realised that this didn't work because I had to make sure that all the star students had to get a license. And I, because it's an ongoing subscription with um, 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 OpenAI, that HEP funding wouldn't allow that. It had to be all at once kind of model and pay. So this, even though I spent time in developing this, it, it didn't, it, this went on, on its feet. But what my purpose here was to develop a, an Indigenous uh, Students to Start project where staff or students, where they didn't know where to start, they could go put in the, in the search engine, and then that could help them give them prompts about where to move in next. These are the challenges. Um, um, I'll let you just read it yourself quickly. Um, yeah, so when there wasn't any clear communication or responsibility or deadlines or where students didn't know what they were doing or star staff didn't know what they're doing or learning designers didn't know where to be in those positions. Um, and they didn't know, should I be helping the staff here more? Should I be helping the student? What am I doing here? So when clarity of roles are not made, this stuff all falls on its head as well. So again, in induction, you, it's very um, important to set that, hey, the learning designer at this point should be working with the staff uh, on point weeks one to four. Then I'll be taking over to support the students here in weeks four to seven. Whatever it may be, you leave time in the induction period to set out roles and responsibilities, but also times to meet 
throughout the year, as well as what system or what online portal they might use. It would be Slack, Teams, chat, email, phone, WhatsApp. Those forms of communications, mediums of communications, the types of communications, and the, the regular in and uh, the in regular inputs of communication over time from the different parties, all three different, the student, the staff, the learning designer, were all critical for this as well. But here at my this Indigenous students, for it was the um, the Indigenous student, the academic, and and myself as the slight learning designer slash uh, academic. Um, yeah, um, let me just quickly, uh, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, and I'll leave, I thought I'll leave with a quote um, about a partnership being more about the process and not just about the product and not just the outcome. Um, and it's about having a, that shared journey, about envisioning a, a different type of education experience where students' values um, are, are heard and their voices are heard um, more than just their, uh, you know, um, their evaluations at the end of the year. Um, so yeah, no, thank you everybody for this presentation. I'd love to hear all your thoughts. Um, I'll stop sharing now and then we can get into more of a conversation together. Um, but yeah, thank you all. I hope you got something out of it. And as you can see how my mind works, it's a bit of, <laughs> it goes, uh, it goes in there and out there, but uh, Hope you all got something out of it for different pockets. And like I said, I'm happy to share any of my research, my benchmarking, and hopefully we could do research together if anyone's interested in, in any of those facets. Mm, thank you. Look, thank you so much, Seb. My name's Leanne, everyone. Um, I, I call come in um, the Lynn Design Sig Sessions with Kashmira, Kate and Keith. But thank you so much, Seb, for that, for this presentation. And it goes to show that people in learning design like yourselves who are higher up, you, you, you're in different roles, you're leading teams, et cetera, and in academic development. Like there's such a broad spectrum of areas that we need to just be on top of. And thank you for showing, for, you know, showcasing some of the research that you're, you're doing and the key highlights that higher education needs to pay attention to as well. And, and I think your, your work and sharing your practical, you know, hands-on um, initiatives with, you know, student as partners and being authentic and candid about, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked is actually really fantastic, you know, because we know, a lot of universities and the work that we do, there's so many initiatives that we have to work on. And sometimes this sharing and caring of what's work and what hasn't worked is something that's of valuable to us and across everyone else as well. Um, and, and I can see the amount of work that's been done. And we know that, I mean, six weeks to get that initiative. And I think yeah. that's, that's amazing as well. Um, yeah. And, and we can see so much work has been, um, you know, put in the background as well. And, like there's so many comments and questions in the chat area across that as well. But I'd love to, you know, hear more about, you know, with the work six weeks, oh my goodness, engagement of staff members and students and then working with, I mean, this is what as a learning designer, this is what we need to know across yeah, all, all different absolutely. areas. But, and, um, yeah. No, Leanne, it just reminded me, one of our partnerships is it kind of in yeah. your area is with, an, um, with, our, uh, with our deputy, Dean of Teaching Innovation in um, Science and Engineering in Cybersecurity and the Indigenous mm. student um, Edward, who are providing more cultural competency or cultural awareness mm. Um, mm. Uh, as well as safety, cultural safety um, mm. for um, uh, Indigenous uh, people. So it's about that cultural safety within cybersecurity, which is mm. something as well, um, is often something most people don't think about, cybersecurity and Indigenous perspectives um, mm. or, you know, Indigenous knowledges or at least Indigenous safety within the curriculum. But that was one of the products of the 18. Um, mm. So that was one of the projects, sorry, of mm. the 18. So the, the projects were quite varied to developing um, Indigenous terminology with a library, to working with streamlining the health program, um, so um, with yeah, bringing units together. So each of those projects were quite um, varied, mm. and there was um, mm. others with learning designers as well. With um, yeah. so that's our team here, our DLD team here. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's fantastic, and then the work that you've done to actually review other universities at desktop review to look at the strategies, these indigenous 
um, in, in digitizing the curriculum and the one that you've just shared us, I think was, was at the University of Sydney with the MBA, et cetera, and a few others. Just, I think that's really fantastic. And I think obviously um, we'd love to see more of that research as well, because a lot of universities are at the moment at different levels as well in terms of working towards that going forward. But um, there's been a lot of information that you just shared, and I think a lot of us, we're going to take it in and see what opportunities there are as well. But before, I just want to see if there's any um, any burning questions that we have from the floor. Um, I've been checking. Uh, there's nothing um, as yet unless somebody would love to um, turn on their mic. So I have lots of questions that I have written it down in email, so I will separately talk to you about okay. it. But yeah, I'll, I'll let... Um, and yeah, please separately email me as well if you feel more comfortable. You're like, all right, I Seb, I've got a few more questions for you, and I want to know how my uni is going on these things because I want to put this new application in for this grant. Um, just email me; oh, I could be able to give you a snapshot of where your uni is. Yeah. Not, you know, and we, I think all unis are doing great in their yeah. different spaces at places in time. So I could give you where that your uni might be in a different space and place in time, and it. Don't think, oh, oh, why don't we do this? You know, it, you know, for us, we're a very small, young university here, so we don't have the money that our UQ does to develop mm -hmm. uh, or have the yeah. initiatives that they do. So we, um, and there is also, I think, uh, because uh, uh, Seb, uh, you and I are in in a similar situation because I'm also in a small regional university where uh, there are more indigenous uh, population, and our students are online, and uh, they are from regional areas. So uh, University Accord said that we have to have like about 4% uh, Indigenous students uh, by 2026 or whatever that is, and we already have more than that now. So I think that situation, but the the uneven, and, and I know that it's like how prosperous the university is, but uneven, um, uh, uh, the resources in the university, that also creates a lot of imbalance into uh, into the growth development and you know uh, recognition in, in terms of recognition that about this learning designers and staff as well um, yeah. so I have just put in some some brand application around like that bringing that uh, resource to a common you know platform that people other people with the Kind of like financially deprived university can make use of it as well so yeah that's that's really interesting no thank you and i just want to take this moment as well to thank everyone here and i want to do this is something i want to make sure that we're all inclusive but agnes as well thank you for coming you know yvonne i really appreciate it denise morgan Patikika, helen trudy lillian emily jubilant mm -hmm. jennifer oh. leanne of course robin <laughs> sam kate celine mm -hmm. jessica peter kashmira and I'll be other Kate. Thank you all for coming today. It means so much to me, and I'm so glad I could share this these pocketed pockets of literature that I'm interested in, and the pockets of practice that I'm into. And I hope I've inspired uh, some of you to think differently, or to to do things differently, Absolutely. or research differently with me. Hopefully, but um, I just want to thank you all for coming today. It means a lot to me as well. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you sir. Uh, I I noticed that Robin had a question, and I don't know if we have time, although. Um, I'm sure people, would, I definitely would be interested in a part two, particularly around Indigenous curriculum at some point. I don't know if others feel the same. Yeah. So um, uh, I, if you are interested, um, participants, please feel free to put a thumbs up in the chat or in your reactions because um, it would be good to know. Because um, uh, Robin's question was around um, engaging Indigenous stake holders uh, and in, in, engaging with Indigenous knowledge holders to develop um, print, some of those principles from earlier. Um, and, and it'd be great to hear more about, um, yeah, working with Indigenous knowledge holders in particular, I think. I, I would, I'm sure several of us would love that. Yes, absolutely. And I hope I can share the, you know, the different universities that did take the principal intellectual property Indigenous principles approach and those that didn't take the, that in their, and some of this went benchmark audit framework quality, go to academic board and went that way instead. And that's a centralized model. The the, the grounds up approach was a community-based um, model. You know, you can see at University of Wollongong where they go on country and do PD on country. Um, so that's probably a different type of model. And that's where principles were based. And same with the uni um, University of Sydney's model with the MBA, where they developed co-designed uh, principles, Indigenous principles, and made that as the key. And that's something that I we're um, doing that project and principles-based stuff now. 
For my Indigenous Students as Partners program, just to answer the question, I actually borrowed those principles from the best practices from other universities. So I kind of amalgamated all the best practices from all the other universities. So, and, and that's probably a shortcoming on my own. You're going, well, Seb, if your university is, you know, you're doing so great, why don't you develop some more Indigenous principles that are centralised? And that's our next step. So what I've done is the benchmark and then the audit, and the hopefully now the next step is to work with our community leaders here and our elders to co-design and, and co-develop that um, principle-based approach. Much like I did with the Students as Partners Initiative, I want to bring that ethical principle-based model and approach as well into our Indigenous space. But um, yeah, sorry, that in, the indigenization as well. I'm so glad that that's taken off as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to do another presentation. Only if you guys would be- That's fantastic, Seb. Look, yeah. I, I'm just gonna wrap this up because I know that um, it's just past that one o'clock and Kashmira, you're more than welcome to press the pause button on the recording as well. 